And you can do this cycle even further. You can, you can take your compound product of the first catalytic cycle, you can protect your oxygen uh, or hydroxy groups by benzylation and deprotect the diamethyl acetal. You can homologulate or you can elongate the chain to make another alpha beta and such aldehydes. And on top of that, you can run another cycle, which we, I think, in the article name as N epoxidation sodium methoxide initiated rearrangement and aziridine uh, sodium methoxide initiated rearrangement. Then you can get these type of very highly functionalized product very, very rapidly. The third uh, publication we did on this topic, again, now you, you probably figured out what this type is about. This, in this uh, article, we, we simply try to lower the, the, uh, the, the catalyst loading of the amino catalyst down to 2.5 mole percent, just to make it uh, more applicable. Uh, and, and then on the addition of a second organocalyst, an heterocyclic carbene type catalyst or precalyst, we will be able to access beta hydroxy or beta amino esters in one part. The yields goes from low to excellent, and it, but the EE is always above 90%. Um, brief mechanism, this is a well-established mechanism using heterocyclic carbene type chemistry where you form the Bresel intermediate, and you basically is a redox couple reaction. You reduce this at this center to the CH, and then you oxidize the carbonyl to an ester. So it's a redox couple reaction forming the first reductively opening, uh, opening the epoxide or azirudine, forming you a activated acyl complex. And in the presence of water or alcohol, you form as an acid, carboxylic acid, or a ester group. Uh, in the product and no erosion of your enantioselectivity. These are all based on aldehyde type, uh, aldehyde type substrate. You can also do the same trick using alpha, beta, and saturated ketones, cyclic or non-cyclic enones. What, we'll, what we will be able to show is that you can do the enone epoxidation, aziridation using this type of synchona alkaloid-based primary amine catalyst. Uh, you use primary amine in this case because uh, these type of substrate are more challenging or more sterically hindered compared to the aldehyde substrate, and there you need to have you go from secondary amines to primary amines. But basically, these type of reactions are well established by other groups. What we only did was, was this, the last part, emerging this part with this part, basically adding in hydrazine hydrate, you'll be able to form allylic alcohols and amines. Yields are not always great, but the EE is usually above 85% up to 99% uh, EE. And in my eyes, then the, the advantage of this approach is that you can generate quaternary centers. You can generate tertiary alcohols so means at the lytic positions, which are usually uh, difficult uh, to approach when you in in, the, in synthetic chemistry. Uh, and you have much less substrate limitation compared to a lot of other type of chemistry you use to uh, furnish this type of products. However, I have to mention one limitation of this approach is that if you have instead of cyclic enones, if you have acyclic enones, then you have absolutely non-control of the E-set ratio of the double bond. And this basically is within, lies within the mechanism of these type of uh, Wharton-type transposition, because during the isomerization or tautomerization, you have one protonation over here, and this can go basically both, this can go both ways. Uh, and if you don't have the cyclic structure here, you have free rotation, and, uh, and upon opening the epoxide the formation of the double bond, you can access both type of structures, E and Z uh, double bonds. So that you cannot control. It's not possible to control this, but for cyclic enone, it works perfectly fine. You don't have any type of product, but usually very good in anti-selectivity. So you can also use this approach for something. You can use not only in an anti-selective synthesis, you can also do it using diastolic diastereoselective synthesis. For example, if I have alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl compound, or enone, uh, already in an you enriched you can have callus control. That means, based on the choice of the callus, uh, you can either get the cis product or the trans type product. Uh, and due to, this, uh, due to the principle of double stereoinduction, 
uh, because you have a chiral starting material and also a chiral catalyst, you'll be able to enrich uh, the EE from your starting material 75% up to above 90% in the product. Uh, and the advantage of queening this queening or synchronal alkaloid type catalyst is also that they are easily accessible and they exist and the starting material for these catalysts exists as so to enantiomeric species where only this stereocenter is different but this is not very much involved when generating stereo induction that means we're using this pair you basically will be able to get both enantiomers of your product. And in this diastereoselective synthesis, you will be able to get both the cis product and the trans product selectively using catalyst control. So that was the first type of strategy. Uh, strategy. Now we'll just go over to the reverse. So not taking one amino catalytic reaction, but take as many amino catalytic reactions as possible and join it with one specific um, transformation afterwards. And basically, this is what this scheme shows. What we were focusing on is the terminal alkyne structures um, due to the importance in different fields of science. The key here is basically to find an approach to link these two things together. Find an approach for the alka aldehyde alkyne transformation, which, uh, which is compatible with the reactions of uh, using amino catalysis. Um, we tried a couple of different approaches, but just let me tell you that this is the, the optimal case, or here a Bestman modification of the Cypher-Gilbert homologation or alkanulation reaction, where you take this uh, reagent upon methanolysis in the presence of potassium carbonate methanol, you generate this anion, which basically uh, reacts with your aldehyde in similar fashion as a a whole with Ammons type reaction, but the additional twist is that upon the liberation of nitrogen and migration of this uh, hydrogen, you will form terminal alkynes. Um, and this is a very efficient reaction that's been used in many total synthesis, and we were simply merging this with, together with asymmetric amino catalysis. Now, uh, the first initial target for this type of reaction uh, is uh, we got based on the review published by Professor Verne Gouverneur uh, in UK, where she wrote the long review in ChemRev about propagylic fluorides and the, their importance. Uh, and also, she emphasized um, the, the methods for their formation, which was not trivial at all. And the, what, the most used method of their formation is from propagylic alcohols, where you do Nucleophilic substitution using a fluorine anion. Uh, however, in this case, due to the competitive SN2, SN1 pathways, you always have to control. You always have to be careful with temperature and conditions, uh, and a lot of time you have erosion of EE rapidly. Another approach using electrophilic fluorine reagent is by using uh, aluminium silanes. However, you have to synthesize these uh, enantiomer rich that is pretty tedious in starting material synthesis. So the idea we had was very, very naive uh, now that we think about it because an idea of it was that we know how to put the fluorine alpha in the alpha to the aldehyde. Why don't we just put the fluorine in the alpha to the aldehyde and then transform this group over to uh, the alkyne group? It's a very simple but also very naive uh, idea because you have an alpha proton to an aldehyde and next also next to a fluorine atom. So this sh should be pretty acidic. And based on these pretty basic conditions, you'll expect erosion of EE and so on. But it, this reaction was very easy to test, and I'll show you it, it works excellently. The yield might not be always that great, but in anti-selectivity, you can always get it above 90%. In fact, I think you can always get it up to around 99% all the time, um, because uh, studies have shown that the fluorination reaction, it's, as a, it's actually, you have a kind of kinetic resolution of your first fluorination reaction. So the first fluorination using amino catalyst is not that selective. It's, it gives you 80-85% EE. However, the catalyst selectively difluorinates the minor enantiomer of the product. That means it selectively takes out the minor enantiomer of the product, leaving the major enantiomer in, in, in larger quantities. So if you wait, and if you can sacrifice a bit of yield, you, can, you should be able to increase the enantioselectivity EE of your final product always. 
Uh, and of course, this compound, we also want to be more practical in terms of uh, our pro uh, developed protocols. This compound you need to synthesize. However, if you take two commercial available reagents and you pre-stir it, mix it in situ, you can generate this and the crude mixture of this you can add to the fluorination reaction and you will be able to form these products in similar yields and similar EE. So that is basically, unless you start with very specific aldehydes, it's basically a reaction using only commercially available reagents. After we demonstrate this reaction, we thought maybe we can take it a step further. Now you show that we can do propagylic compounds. Propagylic compounds. What about doing homopropagylic compounds by first doing nucleophilic addition towards the aluminium ion activated alpha beta saturated aldehyde, and then do the same trick over here. We showed it for a couple of different uh, nucleophiles, nitrogen-based, sulfur-based, and so on, and it works. The, yield, the, uh, the results are not as good as the previous uh, case, but uh, at least it shows the principle that you can do, you can combine these two things together to do this. And I think the reason for you have a lower drop of yield or lower EE is due to a base, uh, base induced retromycal type reaction. And after that, it either leads to decomposition or uh, you have a base induced non, -cal uh, non catalytic or without involvement of the amino catalyst addition of the nucleophile. And that takes your NN2 selectivity down from above 90% to in the range of the 80s. And you can, after this, when you have, where you have shown that you can merge aluminium ion activation together with this type of strategy, you can think about doing organo cascade reactions together with this uh, strategy. And the reaction we looked, it should be familiar to you guys. It's based on the epoxidation reaction where you do first beta and then alpha functionalization. Upon that, you just simply add a crude mixture of this, this or here, Bessman reagent. You will form propagylic uh, epoxide. And now the yields are all back up to reasonable amount and EE is also up because you simply do not have this uh, base-induced retromycal reaction uh, after the formation of your epoxide. And these compounds are very versatile synthetic building blocks. You can do different type of reactions. Here is just two simple examples about ring opening of the epoxide using different type of nucleophiles. So hopefully I showed you that using two very simple ideas, and of course starting with one reaction at the time, you can actually develop the chemistry based on known knowledge within the field of amino catalysis and within the field of name reactions, or what you call. And together you can create high level of synthetic diversity uh, simply by combining different type of chemistry together. So this is a more application or diversity oriented synthesis uh, we finished this type of topic a couple of years ago when we stumbled upon some other, uh, the next topic that I will show, which is remote functional, which we name remote functionalization at this time. And the word remote functionalization, let me just briefly introduce that. And that was, uh, I think, to the best of my knowledge, that was introduced by, uh, by Ron Breslow, Professor Ron Breslow, I think, at Columbia University. He was studying, he is very interested into uh, biomimetic chemistry. And he was amazed by the nature's ability or enzyme's ability to functionalize selectively at sites, uh, one site among a chain, of a chain of hydrocarbons which otherwise seemed very similar, if not identical, to him. And the reaction he, he emphasized was this, uh, this desaturation of steric acid into oleic acid as selectively uh, at one of the positions. So this is more or less magic because you cannot do this in a synthetic lab, at least in, 19, in the 60s, 70s, where he was looking at this. And he made this very nice cartoon of the, uh, of the reaction, basically saying that uh, the enzyme stamps on one of the functional groups over here, and then the monster bites off two hydrogens, creating the double bond. This was his schematic uh, of this type of reaction. So he went into the lab, and he was working on sterile metabolism. He wanted to show how he could do this type of chemistry in laboratory, not using enzymatic systems. And this is basically one of the reactions that he had a great uh, deal of success with, where he's simply to desaturate this double bond uh, or create this double bond here selectively. 
And what you choose to do is simply, you have a functional group over here, so that is where you are, uh, he stamps on and put his foots on, and then you have a linker of appropriate length, and then you have a monster which will be able to take bite off these two hydrogens uh, to form you the double bond. And uh, of, uh, based on the, uh, on the scheme, this is the setup he used. And he could be able to get these product as a single product in his ration above 50% yield. Selectively desaturation of this double bond among uh, uh, several different. If you change the linker, he could do it on other double bonds and so on. So this was the first case what he showed, remote functionalization, site selective.